while we're waiting for everybody to get admitted into the room, it looks like we do have uh, more people in the waiting room. That is a control option for Zoom to make sure we don't get any Zoom bombing. Um, so while people are still joining, I will ask uh, that you, you take this quick poll that's on your screen and you can use the link that we will post. Um, my dear Hannah, can you post into the chat the Poll Everywhere link? Oh dear. Looks like we've got 21 participants so far. We're doing great. Um, still got a couple more people joining the room. It looks like um, we have 12.01, so we're going to give it a few more minutes. To do the poll everywhere, you can use the link that's in the chat box and respond to the question, or you can text. And I will put this in the chat box. Uh, it's Catherine Shack 218. And you should be able to answer the question live on the screen. I'm on, um, I'm on my iPad for it, so. I don't need much. All right. We may be having some technical difficulties with our poll everywhere right now, but um, Hopefully we can. Ah, there we go. Now we see some responses coming in. And if, if you can, please use this uh, as, a, as a first opportunity. We'll be using this tool again later in today's meeting. So we ask that you practice by just submitting an answer to the question on the screen and using the, the services available so you can text Catherine Shack 218 to the number 22333, and you'll be able to engage in this program. You can also go to the website pollev.com slash Catherine Shack 218, and you'll also be able to answer these questions. So for now, um, it is 12.04, and we're going to get started, so I will hand it over to Eric. Thank you, Katie. Hey, good afternoon, all. Eric Miller. Uh, from Tri-County Regional Planning Commission. I'm the executive director and we're located uh, in downtown Peoria. Um, we're here to tell you uh, about an important transportation issue that faces our regions, that region that we have dubbed the gray area. I know that sounds like a uh, sort of a weird Netflix TV series, but as you'll learn from our panel, it's a critical issue as it relates to mobility in the region for some of our most vulnerable population. Um, before we hear from our panel, a few housekeeping items. Um, your input is important to us. Um, thank you for um, logging on today and, and please use the chat feature uh, if you would have any questions. Obviously, we're gonna use the, the poll feature for some questions from the group, um, but if you have questions, just use the chat feature. Um, if you don't have access to the chat feature, uh, we'll provide some time where those people are just on uh, on a phone call can can uh, we can hear from you. Um, please mute your phone or your device uh, to avoid any background or um, feedback sort of issues. Um, so thank you for that. 
Um, with that, I'm happy you've taken the time to join us. Uh, today we'll be hearing from the Lock Mueller team who um, is headed by uh, Katie Shackelford. But first I want to introduce you to Andrew Dwyer, who's Director of Mobility from the uh, Greater Peoria Mass Transit District. And Andy's going to provide you with an overview of the gray area study. Andy, take it away. All right, thank you very much, Eric. Uh, as Eric said, my name is Andrew Dwyer. I'm with uh, Greater Peoria Mass Transit District, also known as CityLink. Uh, to your right on your screen is a, a map. Um, that map uh, shows uh, the Peoria, West Peoria, and the Heights uh, in yellow. That is effectively the CityLink service area. Uh, the area in the white uh, to the left is the rural area, uh, the area that is in the gray on that side of the river and also on the other side of the river is considered the gray area. That is an area uh, that does not re receive any sort of public transit services. Uh, the 5307 funding, which is the urbanized funding for public transit, uh, is used within three-fourths miles of any fixed route boundary. Uh, subsequently, another set of funding, uh, 5311, is used for the rural uh, entities only. And on the Peoria side, that is the county link system. And then on the Taswell side, that is uh, the WeCare system. Uh, those areas are defined uh, via the census. Uh, as uh, the most recent, we had the 2010 census, and then upcoming is the uh, most recent one that uh, we're currently undertaking. Uh, on the east, on the Peoria side, you do have uh, service that is provided uh, previously with 5310 JARC and New Freedom Funding, those are, those are funds that are available for individuals who are disabled, uh, job access, uh, and then uh, other, other different options that are placed out there to, to gauge a need. Uh, on the Taswell side, they, they don't receive any sort of uh, services, so areas such as Germantown Hills, Washington, Morton, Creefcourt, Market Heights, uh, they're an effective no man's land. On that side of the river, you do have contracts with the Greater Peoria Mass Transit District through the city of Pekin and then uh, the East Peoria Mass Transit District. Our goal for this study is to figure out exactly the level of need. Uh, there are roughly 87,000 individuals who aren't served uh, in, the, in these areas. Uh, they're not eligible for rural transit and they're definitely not eligible for ADA paratransit uh, because that is defined as three-fourths mile of any fixed route boundary. So our, our goal is to figure out the need, the formulating strategies, and then looking at ways to implement services in concert with state and local governments. Uh, with that, I'm gonna hand it over to uh, Katie Shackelford uh, with Lockmuller Group, and she can get us uh, started on what we've uh, found out so far. Oh, project schedule. I guess I should probably talk a little bit about the project schedule, I'm sorry. Uh, as you can see, uh, we are in October. We have made pretty good progress throughout uh, existing conditions mobility needs. Uh, we have had uh, stakeholder input and a steering committee. Uh, right now we are analyzing funding and prioritization and then also reaching out uh, for, for public meetings to get additional input before we take our next steps. We do hope to have this wrapped up before the end of May of next year and we believe we are making great progress uh, on the whole process. So again, I'll, I'll switch it back over to Katie. I uh, apologize about missing that slide. No worries, guys. Um, thank you all for being here today, and we appreciate your patience. Of course, with COVID, we are um, we are dealing with kind of a new format, and we're doing this all virtual. So we want to keep everybody safe, but as well uh, as being safe, we want to be informed. So please uh, bear with us as we have some technology hiccups throughout this process, but the more we do this, the better we'll get at it. So the purpose of today's meeting is to review the existing conditions, to, accept, to assess our community needs, and then to gather some new information from you, our participants. So why does engagement matter to this process? Well, it's important because it is going to increase the likelihood of the success of the, the solutions that we present. So citizens who participate in these processes show a significant commitment to help make these projects happen. Uh, it creates a more effective solution by drawing on the local knowledge. The first group, it creates solutions that are practical and effective. It improves the citizens' knowledge and skills in problem solving. Participants learn about the issues in depth. Greater knowledge allows us to make multiple, to see multiple sides of the problem. 
you can participate and practice in the decision making process. It empowers us to integrate people from different backgrounds. So groups that feel ignored can gain greater control over their lives and their community. When people from different areas of the community work together, they often find that they have much more in common than they do. Um, dis this is <laughs> anyway, creating local networks of community members. The more people who know what's going on and who are willing to work towards the goal, the more likely the community will be able to be successful in achieving that goal. Um, it also creates several opportunities for discussing the concerns. A regular ongoing discussion allows people to express their concerns before the problem becomes too big or out of control. And finally, it increased trust in local community organizations and governance, working together to improve communication and understanding. Knowledge of what the government, the community, and the citizens and their leaders are doing uh, can and do refu uh, reduce future conflicts. So with that, we're going to introduce you to the gray area study. We're going to kick it off by introducing you to our team. So my name is Katie Shackelford. Many of you may have known me from my time in Peoria. I am a, a professional. I'm a senior planner for the Locke Mueller Group. Uh, with me today are two of my colleagues, Sharif and Michael. I'm going to have them introduce themselves and share a little bit about their work and experience. I'm a little bit of my background. I spent five years living and working in Peoria. I'm a professional uh, urban planner. And I now work and serve, I work out of St. Louis and serve the Indiana, Illinois, and Missouri regions. So with that, I'm going to hand it over to Sharif. Yeah, thank you, Katie. Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, this is Sharif Ullah. Uh, I work as a travel demon modeler and also transit uh, analyst for Lockmuller Group. Uh, I've been working in this field uh, for more than 15 years, and uh, all, all of these years I've been working in mainly in central Illinois, uh, with clients like Illinois Department of Transportation and other MPOs. Uh, I'm happy to be part of this exciting study. And with me, I have Mike Grovek. So Mike, to you now. Thank you, Sharif. Uh, I'm the uh, senior transit engineer for the Lock Mueller Group. Uh, actually, I have 38 years of experience, um, about a third of that in the public sector, working for several transit operators. and coming up on just 25 years with the Lock Mueller Group. We've overseen a number of transit studies throughout the Midwest, and I'll be serving to oversee all the analysis and reports uh, for this project. Thank you. So now, now that you know a little bit about our team and the work that we do, we're gonna dive into this project. Uh, the first thing we're gonna do is review the existing conditions. So with that, I will let Michael continue. Thank you, Katie. Uh, this page here outlines uh, several main points about our existing conditions report. Let me just first add that this report has been uh, posted on the uh, Tri-County uh, website. They have a transit page on their website. And this existing conditions report is really the foundation of the study. It's there available for your review and input as a draft report before it is finalized here next year. Uh, some of the key items that we have already undertaken, we mentioned consistency with other agency plans. There have actually been uh, five major transportation studies that we enumerate there. Uh, an Illinois state long range transportation plan as well as a state transit plan as well as three major regional plans. And the most recent one of those uh, was the recently released uh, Tri-County uh, Long Range Plan for the year 2045. So uh, if you go to the next page, then this highlights some of the current services in the area. Now these are services in the rural areas of uh, the counties in the uh, Tri-County tri region. Uh, again, the report gives a lot of details about this, but we review uh, both the county link system, which uh, GPMTD, the Greater Peoria Mass Transit District uses third party provider to provide in rural areas, as well as we care in rural areas of Tazewell and Wolford counties. And, 
we just want to really make the point that these services, um, coordinating with them is an important part of this study. And these services have been increasing fairly steadily over the last few years. So uh, it just really shows the need and the potential that's there. And uh, next slide. And again, just to highlight that these areas that you see outlined uh, as the uh, gray area, they're within the urbanized area, but not served by uh, you know the fixed route service or the paratransit complementary that goes with it. This 87,000 is about one third of the population in the entire urbanized area. So it's a really uh, a lot of people here that need better, really need uh, adequate public transportation service. And then one final slide before I turn it back over to Sharif. Uh, just some key elements of what the population of this approximately 87,000 people that they run higher than the urbanized area and income, owner occupied housing, labor force participation, as well as uh, educational attainment. But and lower than average for the non-white population, zero vehicle households, uh, households in poverty and disability status. So again, there's quite a bit of information there. We invite you to review it in the draft report, but these are really some of the key highlights. So now I'd like to ask Sharif to uh, discuss now the needs assessment that we've done. Sharif. Yeah, thank you, Mike. Uh, so as Mike mentioned that uh, the gray area population is approximately 87,000. So one of the primary tasks of this study was to identify how much transit demand we have uh, for the gray area population. Uh, if you please go to the next slide. Kim. Okay, so when we were analyzing the transit demand. We went through three different demand methodologies highlighted in this particular slide. And uh, let me start with the program demand. So the program demand is something which is limited to uh, demand response services. For example, uh, demand includes uh, subscription trips for clients to a social service agency or medical service providers. And then we have the non-program demand methodology, which applies to demand response services and flexible route services open to anyone, open to general public and not associated with any specific service or program. And then lastly, we have the commuter demand, uh, which is a transit demand on a daily basis, where majority of the riders typically repeat their routing and schedules. So uh, for example, daily work trips. Next slide, please. So for the demand estimation, what we did is uh, we followed uh, three methodologies uh, here uh, as well for the calculations. So the first one uh, is from the Transit Cooperative Research Program and IDOT also followed that. So for the program demand, uh, based on our estimation, we found that the annual ridership demand for the gray area is uh, approximately 83,000. And for the non-program demand, uh, we calculated uh, following the TCRP method once again, and then we supplemented this uh, analysis with the National Center for Transit Research method, and uh, where uh, you can also see like, you know, how much uh, sensitive to the cost of those transit trip, uh, if you introduce a fare, one-way fare uh, in your estimation. So what do you get for the non-program demand? So as you can see that it ranges from uh, 195 daily ridership uh, to 287 for non-program. So if we take an average, that's approximately 242. So if we combine these two program and non-demand, we get approximately 518 uh, daily transit ridership demand for the gray area. So what it means, it means that, okay, so if we provide a reasonable transit service with uh, good reliability, we should expect a good number of transit riders uh, to and from the gray area. Next slide, please. So 
In addition to evaluating the existing conditions and calculating the transit demand for the gray area, we conducted a number of stakeholder interviews with public officials, transit and service providers, riders, community groups, and healthcare providers. We began these interviews by asking a set of questions to help us better put the data and information we gathered into context. Through this effort, we gained invaluable insights into the challenges that folks are facing and the potential opportunities that could be used to address them. We summarized these findings to share with you here, but we'll be asking you later to provide your input on what these challenges and opportunities look like to you. First, let's look at the challenges. Overall, our stakeholders identified a lack of transportation options for the elderly and disabled. As more people are choosing to age in place, this problem is becoming a larger challenge. Many cited that the hours of operation and services that are available are too limited. People who have doctor's appointments early in the morning or work hours that extend later into the evening do not have transit available to them. They also noted that many people had no options for transportation on weekends. Some of our stakeholders talked about the challenges of meeting appointments due to riders not being available, or excuse me, due to rides not being available or having to work around uh, busy booking schedules. Sometimes our riders reported that they were uh, waiting for their vehicles out in the snow and cold and not knowing when they would arrive and that caused them a lot of anxiety. Many of our service providers commented that providing transit to this gray area is very expensive. The distance to locations and the variety of destinations makes it hard to find efficiencies and in some cases riders can be on the vehicle for up to an hour. Without increased funding for more vehicles or extended hours or even better technology for trip planning, it's hard to provide services to everyone that needs it. We also heard repeatedly about the challenges faced by service area restrictions, and we will illustrate this in more detail in just a moment. Though many options are available, it's very difficult to navigate the complex network of rules that each service has imposed by their various funding mechanisms. Uh, depending on where a person is located and where they're trying to travel, they may or may not be able to get a ride. And then finally, most transit services available in this region are focused on healthcare and required appointments. So recreation and social services, including shopping and visits to church are a lower priority for service providers and options to get to these activities are very limited. So to illustrate the complex network of services provided in the region, we are in the process of developing a matrix. This is still in draft form, so please don't use this as a reference just yet, but we are refining it and we will uh, incorporate all the nuances of the different services as we continue to uh, learn more. We have provided a color coding to each provider. So actually it's a pattern, code, pattern coding. You'll see uh, CityLink, WeCare, CityLift, and CountyLink all have their own pattern. Um, some of the services like CityLink are available to the general public to use, while others like CityLift are only available to people with a documented disability. To use the matrix, you choose the city from its row on the far left column and search for your destination in the columns to the right. Are you in East Peoria trying to travel to Germantown Hills? You notice that that block is clear. There's no color inside, there's no pattern inside. Uh, that means that if you don't have a car, there is no service available to you through transit. Are you in Pekin and trying to get to work in Morton? Again, there's no transit service available to fill this need. Are you in Washington and trying to get to a doctor's appointment in Peoria? No luck. These are the challenges that our neighbors are facing trying to move around the gray area. But thankfully, our, our stakeholders helped us to explore potential opportunities to solve these complex problems. Opportunities include improving interagency coordination, extending the hours of operation and days of service, increasing the number of transit vehicles on the road to provide more people with opportunities to grab a ride, providing more flexible payment options to allow people to purchase fare online or through an app, increasing access to information about the options that are available and providing real-time rider information so that there's less anxiety about when your ride will come pick you up, and then providing a better scheduling tool to help gain some efficiencies and reduce the cost of providing trips. Now we wanna turn these questions around to you. From what you've heard today, what do you think is the most important issue this study should address? So if you can see the screen in front of you, you can go to the link, uh, pollev.com slash Catherine Shack 218, or text Catherine Shack 218 to 22333. And once you're in, you can 
send a text response, A, B, C, D, E, uh, and it will appear live on the screen. Now, this is the first time we're using this integrated approach in the PowerPoint system. So if you're having difficulty, I am going to be checking the chat box um, as we learn to see if this, oh, it is working. That's great to know. So um, this is a friendly reminder while you're using that system uh, that you can also submit your questions into the chat box at any point in time. And we will be taking your questions at the end of the meeting. Are there any questions right now, Eric, that we might want to address? All right. Well, we do Maybe see I, that. I don't see any. Okay. Sorry. We do see that the, the live polling is, is operating. So please continue to, to place uh, your questions in the, or excuse me, send your responses uh, because we are interested to know what you believe are the most important issues this study should address. Do any of you um, in attendance today have any questions you'd like to ask us right now? All right, well, we'll, we'll allow about 30 more seconds. Um, make sure everybody has an opportunity to use the app. Looks like we have a question in the chat box. Oh, okay, Vera, we will add that to the system. It is looking like in our live approach, the limited service area is coming in as the, the lead challenge, followed by lack of available transportation for elderly and disabled, inadequate hours of operation and high operating costs. So uh, seems like we're getting a clear winner at this point in time and we will take this information back and incorporate it into our study. The second question we have for you today, using the same system, you should not have to log in again. Um, so I'll give you about five more seconds. If you haven't hit submit, we will continue in about three, two, one. And we're gonna move on to our next poll. If the screen will allow it. Maybe having a little bit of technical trouble with this one. So give me just a moment. I'm actually going to stop sharing so that we can jump to the next slide. You are still working. All right. So our next question is also for you, our, our viewers, um, how should we address the challenge at hand? So it looks like we've, we're starting to receive some votes, extending hours. So your options are A through E, extending hours of operations, and extending days of service, providing real-time travel information, improving coordination among providers, providing more payment options, and increasing access to information. And looks like through our live polling, we're seeing improving coordination is coming in at a, um, our top, our top vote getter, Increasing access to service and extending operations days and hours are also coming in with, uh, with high votes. So thank you all for responding. Um, here's we have a comment in the chat box, so we'll check on that. And so I'm gonna give you another 30 seconds to respond. And while you're wrapping that up, we'll be thinking about the next question that we're asking, which are, um, we're going to be talking about some next steps and then we're going to open it up to, to Q&A with our staff. So we're happy to answer any questions you might have. Um, got about 10 more seconds to submit your responses. We do have a dead heat between extending operations days and hours and improving coordination. So we may need a tiebreaker. We'll give you about 10 more seconds. Thank you all for participating. This has been really wonderful. 
So thanks for your feedback. Your results are gonna be incorporated into this study and help guide our next steps. Speaking of next steps, from here on out, our team will be exploring the potential mobility solutions and identifying funding options to pay for those solutions. We'll be meeting again with our steering committee to review our recommendations. And then next spring, we'll be hosting another public meeting, hopefully um, just as interactive and potentially if, if things improve, maybe we have the opportunity to do something more in person. Um, but if not, we will continue to make sure everyone is safe. And with that, we open the floor to questions from the public. Are there any questions? Well, I will ask if everybody can please turn on their cameras. Now is the interactive portion of the program. So appreciate you all being here today. Um, we might just ask a few, a few questions to our, our panelists to help uh, guide this along. So one question we have for Tri-County, um, we've heard the question you know, why, why now? Why are we performing this study now? And um, what has prevented this from being a bigger challenge? So I will ask uh, Hannah and Eric, can you, or, or Andy, if you can speak to that, that would be wonderful. Well, I'll start off and I'll let Hannah and, uh, and Andrew uh, sort of fill in. Uh, the, the reason we chose to do this now, um, partially funding. Uh, we, we were awarded a grant through the Illinois Department of Transportation. This has been a, a back burner project for, for a long, long time, um, for at least um, eight, eight or so years that we've, we've wanted to sort of do due diligence to study uh, this problem. And this problem is, is growing. It's not going to get smaller with time. It's just going to get worse with time because we, the, the gray area is expanding and we expect to see a further expansion of that when the next census uh, comes out and the urbanized area has grown uh, just a little bit. So uh, more of our residents will, will live in the gray area and uh, obviously funding solutions are, 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 are tricky and they're very tight and, and obviously th this has a huge taxation question behind it. Um, so we, we appreciate um, sort of the, the, the input that we're getting here. Um, but but it's it's far from from over in terms of, of public good public policy and, and determining solutions. So um, your input is, is vitally important to to this. But um, just just to answer the reason why now is because simply because the IDOT um, the IDOT department the Department of Transportation awarded us a, a state planning grant to to study this and um, we. Uh, threw some local money in there and had the ability to hire a consultant to sort of give us an overview of the study. So, uh, Hannah, anything to add or, or Andy? Um, I mean, I would add that to the, the kind of why now is that ever since the 2010 census, we did see the expansion of what uh, has been determined to be urban areas. And so, since about 2015 or so, the Regional Human Services Transportation Plan even kind of saw that as a struggle and something to examine further. Uh, at the same time, there had been some dedicated funding, as Andy mentioned earlier in the presentation. Um, there were uh, JARC and New Freedom funds that specifically went to help people access jobs and uh, for people with disabilities to have improved mobility those funds have also expired now. So the timing of getting this IDOT grant to study this further and those funds expiring was really kind of a happy marriage. And we wanna make sure that we get some solutions on the table before there are more people who lack service. Thank you both for, for helping us with that answer. Um, a question for Andrew. Um, we, we noticed in the matrix, it is a pretty complex network of transit systems. Why do some people get service and others do not? Well, Katie, that's, that's a fantastic question. Uh, 
It really comes down to to jurisdiction contracts. Uh, <laughs> it, it, it's 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 very muddy. Um, uh, service for for certain areas that are defined rural. Uh, there's there's certain areas that have um, the, the the gray area on on the Peoria side. Um, luckily, uh, the district has uh, appropriated some budget uh, year over year to provide that. So when you look at that matrix, it comes down to <laughs> whether or not the muni muni municipalities, the governments, um, the the census designated locations, uh, if you fall into a, a certain area, it's really luck of the draw. Uh, in some instances, uh, you Bartonville, for example, uh, some of the residents that live near the airport, they're actually considered ADA paratransit eligible, even though they're within the city limits of Bartonville, they're that close to where a fixed route goes, that they luck into um, $2 uh, ADA service that gets them all over Peoria, West Peoria and the Heights. Uh, whereas you have individuals that actually reside within the city of Peoria, North Peoria, uh, out North Knoxville and, and the Schnooks area that um, that don't fall into that same criteria. And so it, it's very it's very difficult um, based on the landscape in the area to figure out whether you are or whether you are not um, within a certain service area. And then, of course, you cross cross over the river uh, into Taswell and Woodford and uh, we care provides uh, the primary responsibility for transit over there in the rural area uh, and then we have partnerships with the city of Pekin and uh, the East Peoria Mass Transit District to provide service over there uh, outside of those areas it's it's just uh, like I said an effective no man's land so uh, it is luck of the draw and that's what we're trying to do is we're trying to identify how we can uh, work better together to figure out different ways to get some service to those individuals that we definitely know need it. We have uh, we have a real life case study that we provide service day in and day out over on the uh, gray area on the Peoria side, Chillicothe, Dunlap, Bartonville, far north Peoria, that uh, we, we have ridership, we have data that we can provide. So uh, this study, as, as Eric and Hannah mentioned, it's perfect because we do have some very raw, fresh data that we can take into consideration as well. Thank you. Um, let's see, uh, we have a question from Ed Andrews. Weren't the latent transit districts formed to block CityLink services? I believe that's a question for you. Transit districts to block CityLink services. Can you, re can you ask that question again? I did not hear the first part. Certainly. So the question is, weren't there latent transit districts formed to block CityLink services? Were there not, weren't there latent transit districts? Uh, you know, I, Katie, I, I can't necessarily speak to the reason, reasons as to why. Um, the, dis, the transit districts in the area that I am aware of that are not a part of our district, which is Peoria, West Peoria, and the Heights that were, were founded in 1970, uh, is the East Peoria Mass Transit District, which we have a partnership with. And we provide uh, three routes in complimentary ADA paratransit service. Uh, the only district that I have heard of, and I can't corroborate whether or not it is actually uh, in effect, is Washington uh, founded some sort of transit district um, based on what I've heard throughout the years. However, I don't know uh, why that was created, if that was created to attempt to get service. I do know we have uh, a partner that Hannah and I work with over there from the Washington Township that has been very active and aggressive in trying to obtain services uh, for uh, residents within that township. But I am unaware of the intentions of the perceived Washington uh, locale. I'm not positive whether, whether or not it was actually created or was a discussion, but I, I am aware that we have a partnership with the East Peoria Mass Transit District and uh, they were created to provide service for their residents. I could briefly add on to that, just knowing that I think I heard around, um, I wanna say Savoy or something, uh, one of the kind of Champaign-Urbana communities, they really did form a transit district with no intent of actually providing service. Um, so I don't know of something like that happening around here, but that is something that has been done in other areas. So I've, I've heard of it at least. Yeah, One other um, thing. Oh, go ahead, Sheree. Oh, I'm sorry, Katie. I think Hannah is correct. Uh, it was not Savoy. It was the Southwest part oh. of Champaign. 
so they formed a transit district just to um, prevent uh, Champaign Urban Mass Transit District to annex that area. So uh, they collected some property tax funds and they uh, spent all those money for uh, the legal fight and all those. So uh, at the end, it didn't help uh, the Southwest Trans uh, at the Southwest Champaign area. So after probably three, four years, uh, that was dissolved. So they never provided any transit service though. We heard that they had two or three PT cruisers. So <laughs> that's all they had. So. Not Thank the kind you. Of solutions we're looking for. Yeah, not the kind of cruisers. Um, some other things that to take into note, um, this gray area challenge is not unique to Peoria. In fact, other communities across the region are also dealing with it. Um, in the Chicagoland area, they call it the transit desert. Um, they also happen to call it the gray area down in Springfield and similar solutions of, of cooperation and shared resources have been proposed. Um, so I just didn't, I wanted everyone to be aware this is not a new problem, but it is definitely something um, taken into consideration that how others have, uh, have addressed it. Um, so I just want to open it up again. We have quite a few people on the call. I'd be interested to hear uh, what you're curious about learning more, uh, what, you're, what you'd like to learn more about, uh, what brought you to our meeting here today. So feel free to, to turn yourselves off of mute and turn on your cameras. We'd love to have a dialogue. I can, I will voluntold you, Ed Andrews, because I know you're good at asking questions. Okay, Ed says he's all done. Um, anyone else want to share why, they're, why they've chose to join us this afternoon? We appreciate having you here and taking the time today. Hi, my name is Kristen Gizondi. Um, I joined the call today just because I'm an HSTP coordinator for my region and three, yeah, there are three urbanized areas in my region and gray area transportation is a huge issue for um, collaborating between the rural um, trans agencies and urbanized trans agencies and well documented in all of our HSTP plans, but I wanted to hear what PRA is doing. Wonderful. Well, thanks for joining us and where are you coming from? Uh, Champaign-Urbana. Oh, okay. Well, you can speak specifically to that Champagne challenge you're facing. Yeah. Um, we have, a, <laughs> Tough we have a question in the chat box from Brandon who says, oh. uh, what are some of the possible solutions that we can learn from the other gray areas or tra transit deserts? Um, we're still exploring those right now. Does anybody have any options they'd like to share? I know that um, in Springfield, there were some options about sharing funding among agencies and creating a collaboration. I think that, um, Andrew, what you can speak to, the work that's being done on the Peoria side of the river is a similar solution um, to creating a, a network where those rides can pass from agency to agency. Sure, I'd be glad to talk about that. Uh, roughly five years ago, uh, in partnership with Peoria County, we, we identified a, a need to provide services to the residents um, of the gray area. And we were presented with a unique challenge that we had the rural component uh, that would was able to provide certain services and the urbanized component, which component, which could provide certain services. So we, we entered into an intergovernmental agreement uh, that we could send either of those services to provide uh, that transportation. Uh, the goal was to a, become more efficient and B, provide um, those services uh, to those individuals within those areas. We did use the funds that Hannah had talked about. Uh, and what our results were, uh, our ridership, uh, our KPIs attached to that, uh, we, we, we hit those targets and we became much more efficient. We were providing uh, roughly 1.25 rides per hour on the county link side. Uh, those numbers actually reached um, upwards of two and over at times. Uh, even uh, once or twice, we outperformed the, the city lift service. And then that's saying a whole heck of a lot when you can be traveling from as far away as uh, Elmwood or Brimfield or, or the little little town of Laura, uh, getting all the way into most of the times uh, Peoria, Peoria Heights or West Peoria. 
And so we were able to figure out at that point that um, not only is this is this efficient, it's it's very ju judicious with the taxpayer dollar. Uh, it was a pilot program that was okayed by the state of Illinois, and uh, it's 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 proven very fruitful uh, on our end. Our, our city lift service, uh, we've we've been able to pick up some of the slack from time to time as we have vehicle availability as well. Uh, ex effectively extending those vehicles out uh, when we don't have the capacity on on the county link system. It, the, the issue is funding at this point, uh, but we're we're taking what we have, and we can see that uh, it is it is very responsible uh, as far as the the dollars and cents that are uh, put forth. Uh, simply because you're you're providing you're taking the same amount of vehicles, and you're already driving through an area, and you're you're picking up additional people, which it's the whole rideshare platform. And when you take an Uber, you you ride by yourself. It's it's. Ten, fifteen dollars, but if you do the ride sharing platform, it's it's half the cost, and that's what we're trying to obtain there, and that's what we're looking at trying to implement uh, across the Peoria region. Thanks. I would also add um, that we are looking for one of one of the challenges is that there's rural areas that are unincorporated, so there would need to be some um, interplay between the county, the city agencies, and and the rural transit providers as far as um, certain people are, are providing service but not paying into the system. Certain people are uh, receiving service or not receiving service and are, um, are not getting their equal share. So we are looking at opportunities where we can make the, the, uh, the case to local agencies um, that providing some cost share from, say, Tazewell County or other agencies would be beneficial for the entire region and, and their residents. So, Katie, I would just add that that uh, elected official awareness is probably one of the, the largest things that that could benefit from uh, the folks on this call to, to reach out to their elected officials, whether they're city council people, mayors, uh, county board officials like Mr. Hovey, um, or, or even state representatives. Uh, there's a whole host of rules and regulations that that transit districts and, and people that receive federal funds and state funds that have to follow that um, somehow, somehow or sometimes, you know, sort of prohibit transportation. And th those are the barriers that, that we need to break down. But obviously, um, we can't do that unless the elected officials are aware uh, that there is an issue and that it's causing their constituents problems. Um, so so um, again, this, this study is here to raise that awareness, uh, hopefully put it in a package that uh, can can inform uh, policy folks that all around the region and state uh, that that there are issues as it as as we face mobility and we face sort of a, a sprawling landscape that people don't have access to to the rider rides they need and and uh, most often it's vulnerable transportation and and that's that that's you know like, like I say around the office we can do better than that here so let, let's try to do better. Thank you for that, Eric. We really appreciate it. That that's a great point, and we wanted to give you the opportunity. If you're if you're not one who's interested in speaking up during the meeting, or if you want to ask more questions after the fact, we have um, made our information available. So my contact information is listed here on the right. Rima, who is with Tri County Regional Planning and is the HSTP coordinator, is on the left. Um, please feel free to contact us and ask any questions. You've got our emails, phone numbers. Um, websites, everything there. This presentation has been recorded and it will be posted to Tri-County's website. We will have an evening meeting for those who are not able to attend our lunchtime meeting today. It's going to be the same presentation, but also allowing people to ask questions live and, um, and do those poll everywhere exercises. So please keep that in mind that this is an open and transparent process that we're asking. If, if you're interested and wanna learn more, please feel free to reach out. The information has been made available so that you can track us as we move forward. The next steps, like I mentioned, are going to be the steering committee meeting. You will anticipate seeing us again in the spring to do a presentation of some recommendations. And we, we strongly encourage you to help us spread the word uh, about what's going on here. Another just interesting fact that we have learned through this process is that our, our seniors or our older adults who are aging in place, when they lose the ability to uh, 
to have independent mobility, to move around and do the activities and socialize, um, their quality of life declines rapidly as well as their health. And so this is a solution that can help keep people happy and active and engaged in our communities much longer into their lives. Um, and we think that's a really big opportunity for us, just not only in building a stronger region, but for, for keeping um, people and businesses engaged from, from cradle to grave. We really wanna make sure that the Tri-County region serves all its residents uh, through every stage of life. And so with that, um, again, we invite you to share questions. Um, we will be, you can go to our Eventbrite page and attend the evening meeting. You'll be receiving the same information. This presentation has been posted to Tri-County's website at the link listed below. So you can see the information we've shared and feel free to share it with others. Um, as a reminder, that matrix is still in process and there is a lot of nuance about where you can and cannot go. So um, please don't use it as a go-by just yet. We are still working on it. Is there anything else um, our team would like to add before we, we call it a day? Hey, Katie, can I say something real quick? Yes, please. All right, my, for those of you who don't know me, my name is Brian, I'm the general manager. I've worked uh, for the County Link and the City Lifts Service Area, so I work closely with Andy. And one of the things that I've noticed with us being able to go into the gray area, uh, just to kind of piggyback off of what he was saying, uh, like for example, I'm gonna use Bartonville for example, because Bartonville is a unique area. It has city, it has ADA service in it, it has urbanized service area, and it has rural. So there's at times where I might have a County Link bus over there picking up a rural rider, who can just quickly run over there and pick up that urbanized rider and take them in. And there's also times where there's a city lift rider over there picking up uh, an ADA person who might be able to run in there. So it really works out great with the coordination of that. So uh, there is a lot of things that we have to look at that on, on, the, uh, other, on some of these other gray areas because you're gonna run into parts where they're gonna fall into the ADA or some's gonna fall in the urban, some's gonna fall in the rural. And they're just, so just the coordination of it works really well. To elaborate on that, Brian, is I think that's great that you guys have the choice to run both buses, but the problem I come into is because I have to pay different fees to ride those buses. Good point. Um, do you mind sharing your name with us? I'm sorry, I'm Dawn with Epic. Thanks, Dawn. We appreciate having you here and, and appreciate your feedback. Would you be interested in elaborating a little more for everyone else on the call what you mean by the, the different payments? I, yeah, I would fine. actually be able to answer that, uh, Dawn, if you don't mind. No, go ahead, Amy. Okay, so previously, uh, the County Link service was operated by uh, Peoria County. Uh, within the past year and a half, two years, uh, the Greater Peoria Mass Transit District took that over. And Dawn, with your most recent contract, um, I actually included both uh, City Lift and County Link, that's the whole uh, idea of the coordinated dispatch, the consolidated service, and that was one of the facets. Uh, as we're not collecting fares currently, uh, you haven't seen the dividends from that, but uh, effectively anyone in the rural area uh, pays the, the $6 fare uh, when they're on a contract. Anyone that is uh, within the urbanized area pays a $5 fare, and it doesn't matter which vehicle you hop on, if it's City Lift or County Link. Uh, you can ride either of those vehicles in there and it is a $5 fare. And then anyone within the ADA service area, uh, it is uh, $2 uh, per ride. Previously, if you rode city lift in the urbanized area, it was a full $6. And then previously uh, in the county link uh, vehicles, it was actually four uh, and it's, it's gone up to, to five. So that has changed a little bit, Dawn, but I understand uh, if it could be one, one fare across the board for all services, that would be fantastic. But yeah, we are trying to make some efforts to fix uh, some of that. Uh, and one, of, one contract for, for both services has helped uh, make the fare structure a little bit more even now that uh, we're operating both. Excellent. Any other questions before we go today? Hello? Hello? We hear you. Yeah, this is Vera. I, since we have uh, three or four more minutes, I just thought I would share uh, my point. I am here only to learn more about uh, how I can uh, use this one, particularly for my wife and some of the neighbors who don't like to drive certain times. So uh, that's one of the reasons. We live in uh, one of the gray areas. Uh, 
uh, maybe I can look uh, more information about on that one. Some people mentioned about Champaign-Urbana, that uh, Southwest uh, Champaign-Urbana. Actually, I was uh, living there five years ago. Uh, that uh, study or the service did not go through because some of the neighbors, particularly in the Cherry Hills subdivision where I was living and I was also on the homeowners committee, uh, there people didn't want buses, city buses to be roaming around in their neighborhood. That was the main resistance. Uh, but eventually, uh, certain times, uh, you know, they were allowing, I don't know how it is going on right now since I have moved uh, to Peoria five years ago. I just want to share that information. Thank you. Thank you for sharing. We appreciate that and, and good insight. We do know, you know, riders of choice, people who just who would prefer not to drive an individual vehicle. We don't have very many options for them at all. So we're definitely looking at um, how this solution can, can impact those aspects of people's lives as well. So with that, um, I, will, I wanna thank you all for taking time out of your day to join us. Um, please keep an eye on Tri-County's website. We'll send periodic updates so that you can follow our, our progress as we move forward. Um, I'd like to thank Tri-County and Greater Peoria Mass Transit District for, for inviting us to be here and, and serve you through this project and for IDOT for providing the funding to do this study. Um, I will, I'll turn it over to Eric at Tri-County if there's any other questions or any other comments. Yeah, just real quickly, um, it's not all the time that, that when we do a study with a consultant that we have uh, these sort of mid midpoint uh, public meetings and um, obviously this is unique because it's so much driven on public input and, and your input. So um, please take advantage of this to, to influence the study. Um, if you have strong feelings about one thing, I would uh, suggest you contact one of our team members and become as involved as you'd like um, because that's why we're here. Um, with that, um, I, I, I wanna thank everybody that's been involved and thank you for your time this afternoon. Um, again, I, I, if you have the opportunity to click on at six, it, it may be a little bit different show, who knows? Um, but um, we, we will be in contact with you um, and appreciate your time, everyone. Thank you. Thank you, everybody. All right.